I want to talk to you today called The Lesson of the Tamarisk Tree. And this is still in the series of my Contend for the Faith that I've been teaching on. These are on YouTube. This is part five. To contend for the faith means to uh, literally to stand up to fight. And sometimes as believers, we have to fight in the spirit for the faith. We need to stand up for the things of God. Amen. And so today I want to share with you, and this is a word that the Holy Spirit gave to me about three weeks ago on a Friday night. And it was uh, on Friday nights, I do a long teaching like I do here. And then I do a short little, I call it a madrash, a mini teaching, where it's five minutes. And that five-minute teaching I taught on Tamarisk Tree, and the Holy Spirit so put this on my heart and showed me how it relates to our study in Jude today that I want to bring that to you. So hang out with me this morning, and let's study about the Tamarisk Tree. First, I want to go through a little review. Uh, This study of contending for the faith is literally out of the book of Jude, as we've been going through the book of Jude. And a quick review from last week. Uh, David, this is King David, who's king over Israel. He says, is there not a purpose? And he had gone up against Goliath, and his brothers were complaining, saying he was there because of pride and all these other reasons. And he looks at them and he says, is there not a purpose? And we said, is there not a purpose today for us to stand in the kingdom of God and to stand up for the things of God and to contend for the faith? And then we talked about how one of the first battles that King David went to as king of Israel was against the Philistines and against a king um, of the Philistines at that time. And God had told him that he'd had the victory. He fought him. He had the victory in the first battle. But then there was a second battle. And in the second battle, King David asked God, God, should I go against the Philistines in the same manner? And God said, no, what I want you to do is I want you to go behind them. I want you to flank them. He said, I want you to flank them, but don't attack them until you hear the rustling or hear the sound of marching in the treetops of the mulberry trees. I love that because the sound of marching, rabbis, ancient rabbis say that it was the sound of angel footsteps that they were listening for in the tops of the mulberry trees. Amen. And so David, he went around, he flanked the enemy. He took his army, flanked around behind them. He waited until he heard the sound of marching in the treetops. Who marches in treetops? Angels. He waited till he heard the sound of the marching of the angelic host of heaven. And then he went to war, and God went before him, and they not only won that battle, but this time they won the war against the Philistines, amen? And this was the point of that. Can you and I discern the times in which we live? Can we hear the sound of angelic host of heaven marching in the mulberry treetops? Can we tell that there is something transpiring in this nation, that there is a battle, that there is a contention, that there is something that we haven't seen in our lifetime. And I'm telling you, there is not a political battle, though it is political. It starts off in the realm of the spirit. And the things political are simply a reflection of this battle that's transpiring in the spirit. And it's because God's people are contending for the faith. And as they do, Those who stand against the faith are becoming louder and more vocal than ever before in the history of our country, in the modern history, anyway. In this time, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I said, is this the time to be complacent and to sit in the field while the sound of marching is in the tops of the mulberry trees? What did David's army do when they heard the marching in the mulberry trees? It says they allowed the Lord to go before them and they followed behind them. When you and I have an opportunity to see the Spirit of God do such a work in this city, in this community, in your neighborhood, in your household, we've got to do what we can to get behind it and to support it. Amen? Whether it's financially, with it's your time, whether it's rolling egg and turkey sausage burritos, Whatever our thing is, we're doing something, amen? And like Toby said, one person can't do it. The days of the Billy Graham, I'm telling you, I think are over. I think it's going to be the Spirit of God moving in all the body of Christ, men and women, young people and old people who've committed their lives to Jesus, who say, Lord, here am I, send me, use me for your purpose to bring your gospel 
to people who are lost. Amen? That's what's going to happen. And that was a quick review. So now let's get into new stuff. You say, man, I wish I could have heard that. You still can. It's on YouTube. Okay, get with Josh. He'll show you where it's at. Or wait for your email, and you can click it. It was in uh, this week's email as well. So what is the lesson of the tamarisk tree? I want to talk about this, so let's get straight to it. In Genesis chapter 21, verse 22 through 26, And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now, Abimelech at this time, now we're way before the time of King David. Okay, We're at the very beginning in Genesis, we're with Abraham. And Abraham's in the wilderness, and... Abraham, in the wilderness, has met the king of the Philistines. Again, the Philistines. And this king's name is Abimelech. And Abimelech has his army commander, okay, his lieutenant colonel, his general. And his general's name is Phicol. And the Phicol is the commander of his army. And he speaks to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now I want to tell you a quick story about this Abimelech here in a little bit. Verse 23, so the king recognized that God was with Abraham. Did you know people in your jobs, in your workplaces, in your neighborhood should eventually recognize that the Lord's with you, that there's something weird maybe or different about you? Not weird as in weird, but weird as in different. Amen. In verse 23, it says, this is King Abimelech speaking to Abraham. He says, now therefore swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me. Now, why do you think King Abimelech said that? Because if you know your Bibles, King Abimelech, his father was named Abimelech. And his father was the one that Abraham took his wife Sarah and went to him and said, hey, this isn't really my wife, this is my sister. And told the king that it was his sister. Remember that? And then the king got diseased and sick and was about to die. And because he was going to take Sarah for his wife, because he thought Sarah was Abraham's sister. And then God showed him in a dream that that's that man's wife that you've got, that you're fixing to take for your wife. And he says, I'm going to kill you if you touch her. You can read about it. That's what it says. Well, the king, he's like, I had no idea, God. So he calls Abraham in, and Abraham says, well, I was afraid you'd kill me for my wife because she's so beautiful if I told you she was my wife. So that's why I told you she was my sister. Well, this is that king's son. And dad told him all about what Abraham did. So that's why he says, don't deal falsely with me like you did with dad. Okay? He says, with my offspring or with my posterity, but that according to the kindness that I've done to you, you will do to me into the land in which you have dwelt. And Abraham said, I will swear. I will make a covenant with you. Then Abraham rebuked Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had seized. Now, how many of you know, in these days of old, when they went to drill a well, they didn't have a drilling company, as they called, and they came out there with their equipment, and they drilled down a couple hundred feet, and they hit water, and they pulled up, and they dropped an electric pump in there, and they've got a well. In those days, if you wanted a well, you were out there with shovel and pick. And Abraham's servants were out there digging a well. And they dug this beautiful well, they hit water. Well, they left to go get their stuff. When they came back, Abimelech's guys had gone and filled in that hole with dirt. How many of you think that's kind of mean? So they filled in the well. And this happened several times. So now Abraham is there, and he rebukes Abimelech. He says, your servants have been filling in our wells. They've been taking the well and filling it in. And Abimelech said, I don't know who's done this thing. You did not tell me. In other words, this is the first I've heard about it. He said, nor have I heard of it until today. And Abraham set seven lambs of the flock by themselves. Then Abimelech asked Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven lambs which you have set by themselves? And he said, you will take these seven lambs from my hand, that they may be my witness that I've dug this well. Now, this has got to be one of the craziest stories because Abraham's buying the well that he already dug and owns. Isn't that weird? That's like you paying for a car, then going back to the dealership and saying, you know what, here's more money just so you can repair the car that you already sold me. 
Now, some of them actually try to get you to do that. <laughs> but that's what he did. He said, here's seven ooh lambs. I'm gifting them to you just so you know, and it's a witness today, that this is my well. We dug it, amen? Now, look at this. Here's the key verse coming up. Therefore, he called that place where the well was and the place where they had met Beersheba, because the two of them swore an oath there. They made covenant together. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. So Abimelech, who was the king, rose with Phicol, who was his commander, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. Wait for it. Here comes verse 33. Then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And here was my question to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, when I first read this, I'm going to show you the revelation the Holy Spirit gave me. I said, Lord, why did Abraham plant a tamarisk tree? And why is that important enough that you put it in the Bible? There has to be something to that. Are you following me? And I want to show you what the Lord revealed to me. Here's the characteristics of a tamarisk tree. Okay, It grows in soil with high salt. Matter of fact, it's the only tree found on the shores of the Dead Sea to this day. Now, the Dead Sea, if you know anything about it, it's got all that magnesium and calcium chloride filled with salt. And growing on the banks of that Dead Sea is the tamarisk tree. During the heat of the day, the tamarisk tree secretes salt. Now, why is that important? I'm going to show you. The salt dries on the tree, and during the night, the salt absorbs water from the air. In the morning, the water evaporates, creating a sort of natural air conditioning. This evaporative cooling effect is another reason for its popularity as a shade tree. So listen, you can have a 10 degree difference in a normal shade tree. If you're in a 100 degree sun and you go in a shade tree, it might be 90 degrees in the shade. But with a tamarisk tree, because it's gathered up all this water all throughout the tree, onto the salt, all the moisture and humidity from the air, then as the sun hits it, it begins to evaporate that water. That evaporative cooler cools it about another 10 degrees. So now it's 80 degrees under that tree while it's 100 degrees in the sun. It's almost, you ever stand under a mister? Those little misters and it cools you down with evaporative heating? Then I say, all right, so pastor, so what's the importance of Abraham planting a tamarisk tree? Great. So he had outdoor air conditioning. What's that have to do with anything? I'm going to show you in a minute. It's an extremely slow growing tree. Everyone say slow growing. Slow growing tree and has to be cared for in order to do well. In other words, it's not like a mesquite tree. You can't just plant it and forget about it. Mesquite trees, you don't have to plant them. They plant themselves. Amen. Amen. And they just grow. You don't see anybody in the fields tending all the thousands of mesquite trees, right? Tamarisk tree isn't like that. You've got to tend to it. You've got to take care of it to get it to grow properly so it doesn't turn into a bush but turns into a tree. Why did Abraham plant tamarisk trees? Literally in the Hebrew, it's like a grove of trees, more than one tree. They're at the well. This is why. To a Bedouin or a Jew, you don't plant a tamarisk for yourself. You plant it for the generations to come. And this is what the Holy Spirit showed me. Abraham made that well in Beersheba. He wasn't just thinking about his flock that needed to be watered right then. He was thinking about his children and his children's children. And he planted the tamarisk tree there because he was planting that tree for future generations in that spot to provide shade for generations to come. And this is what I think the Holy Spirit can help us to learn from this planting of the tamarisk tree. Abraham took the idea that he's planting this tree to say, for generations to come, my family's going to be here. Remember, Abimelech's men kept trying to fill in the well. In other words, they kept saying, you know what, Abraham, you're not always going to be here. We're going to fill in the well and you're going to move on somewhere else. Uh Uh-uh, didn't happen. Abraham says, nope, for generations to come, my family's going to be here. And I'm telling you guys, spiritually speaking, we need to say, for generations to come, my children and my children's children and my children's children's children are going to serve the Lord God. 
They're going to walk in faith and they're going to be servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? You and I have to think like that and plant like that into their lives. This shade is for the generations to come. Abraham would never get to use that shade tree. He would be long dead before it would be tall enough to gather any sort of comfort and joy from the desert sun to enjoy it. Do you understand that? So what does that mean? How much of what you and I do in life is done for just ourselves? Don't answer this, but I want you... This is all of us, amen? How much of what we do in life is done for just ourselves? Did Abraham plant the tamarisk tree for himself? Everyone say no. Our comfort, our profit, our satisfaction... Do we do anything to bless or to plant a seed for the generations that are to come? Is there anything that you're currently involved in that will outlive you? Listen, guys, this congregation here, this congregation doesn't belong to me, it belongs to the Lord. You're the Lord's people, not Bruce's people. Someone say amen. Friday night, they're God's people. They're not my people. The congregation belongs to the Lord. Look around the facilities. That doesn't belong to me. Doesn't even belong to you. Belongs to Foursquare. To, amen? Foursquare Corporation. They own the property. They own the land. They own it all. Nothing here belongs to me except for some books in the library. So why do I always spend so much time trying to improve and make things? It's not for me. It's for generations to come. I've never met, did you know this church was started over 53 years ago? I never met the pastor at the start of this church. One day, if Jesus doesn't come back, future pastor's not going to know who Bruce was. He's not even going to care. But I'm not doing it for him. I'm doing it for Jesus. Amen? So that this facility one day will facilitate its purpose in the kingdom of God in this place, in this city, for generations to come. That's why I do and we should do what we do. Are you following me? It's not about us. A thought is to do something this week in your life that will benefit people long after you're gone. Long after you're gone, is there something that you're doing in your life that will continue to benefit others? You have to think about that. The tamarisk speaks. It's speaking to us today. What will we hear? What will we do? What was the results of Abraham's decision about Beersheba? Beersheba takes its name from the phrase, the well of the seven. Now, why do you think the well of the seven? Because how many ooh lambs did Abraham give? Seven. seven. So that they called it the well of the seven, which in Hebrew is Beersheba. Isaac, Abraham's son in the future, also quarreled over a well in Beersheba and named the place the well of the oath. Had a problem as well with Phicol down the road, his son. It became the proverbial southern border of biblical Israel. Abraham, Hagar, remember Hagar? Okay. She gave birth to Ishmael. Okay. She was Isaac's, uh, I'm sorry, Abraham's other wife. Okay. Abraham, Hagar, Jacob, Elijah, all experienced life-changing encounters with God in association with Beersheba. So this place of the well, this place of the tamarisk tree, affected the kingdom of God and affected... Biblical Israel for generations to come. You and I can't imagine the effect of what we do and how it might affect generations to come. Did you know, I want you to think about this. You know what? <clears throat> I'm going to show you one more thing, then I'm going to quit. But, but I want you to think about this. And the Holy Spirit just showed me this. Remember Cain and Abel? Remember that Cain, in Genesis, killed his brother Abel, right? And it wasn't hidden from God. He's God. He knows everything. Amen? And God told him and said, your, your brother's blood cries out from the earth. And that word blood in the Hebrew, and you can look it up, it's dam, D-A-M, is kind of the transliteration. It's not just singular, but it's actually a plural word. So your brother's bloods cry out. And this is what that means. When Cain killed Abel, 
he not just killed Abel, but he killed all the future generations that Abel was going to produce through his loins. His children's 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 children on down the line. And so by killing him, he killed off a generation of people. Do you understand that? And God said, your bloods, your brother's bloods cry out. If that's true in the negative, could that be true in the positive? And this is what I mean by that. When we lead somebody to Jesus, 663 some bodies, and they're born again into the kingdom of God, now their generation, their children are affected, their children's children, and you affect the entire generation for righteousness. Isn't that awesome? Future generations to come. Does our Heavenly Father think of future generations? Remember I told you our study is kind of based on the book of Jude. So here in Jude chapter 1, I want to show you one more thing the Holy Spirit showed me and then we're going to quit. In Jude 1 verse 8 through 9, it says, Likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. And in context, he's talking about false teachers who will come one day into the church and this false thinking and that's why we have to contend for the faith. But the next verse is the key verse I want to mention and talk about here that fits in with our subject today. He goes on, Jude says this by the Holy Spirit. He says, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending, fighting against the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. And this is what I want to talk about. Why did the Lord not want Satan to have the body of Moses? Don't answer. I want you to think about it for a minute. Why did the Heavenly Father, they were disputing, Michael and Satan were disputing over the body of Moses. That's the Bible. Everybody say the Bible. That's what it says. There had to be a reason why they were fighting for the body of Moses. Let me tell you what I believe that reason is. And I want to explain to you how I think the Father was looking to future generations. I think, had the Lord not hidden Moses' body, I think the children of Israel would have had it interred, and they would have turned it into an idol and ended up worshiping it. Just like they did with the bronze serpent on the snake. It became a stumbling block for Israel. And the same thing I think would have happened to Moses. So I think that the Lord was thinking of future generations of Israelites who would stumble because of false worship, turning from God to worship Moses. And I think that's why he didn't want the body of Moses to uh, be revealed. Are you following me? Now, I know that's a little speculation there, but I'm just showing you what I believe the Holy Spirit showed me as far as insight. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is always concerned about our generation but also future generations. Because our Heavenly Father is outside of time, amen? He is El Olam. He is the Eternal One. He is the beginning, the middle, and the end. He sees it all at the same time. So what we do that affects the future generations of people's lives, He already knows. And I think we affected future generations this week. I believe that, amen? I believe that with my heart of hearts. But you know what? You affect future generations. The person at work that you're ministering to, the person that you encourage or pray with, the per- I mean, it just happens all the time. We have to think about not just today, but there are future generations in play here. Amen? That the Spirit of God wants to use us. Listen, I don't want to just die and have an obituary. Oh, he was a part of the Rotary Club and did a great job. He enjoyed playing golf. God bless him, we're going to miss him, and he survived by this person, this person, this person. Amen. Man, I want something that says, you know what? We were able to touch generations. They touched their children. Their children touched their children and touched their children. Man, there's grandchildren in the kingdom of God making an impact on this planet for Jesus because of what one set of parents did. Wow, that's awesome. That's impactful. That's generational. Amen? I want to invest my time, my energy, and my money into things that are going to have an impact on the next two generations. Amen? 
I'll be honest with you, that's the whole reason. I used to pastor a non-denominational church when Karen and I first started in the ministry for 10 years. That's the whole reason I went away from that is because when you're gone, it's personality driven. And when you're gone, there's nothing left. I want, man, when I'm gone, there's still a church going. God's still using people. Things are still happening in the facilities, amen? There's some result in long-term thinking in what we're doing. A wise man and a wise woman plant for the future. Think about that. We cannot reject the next generation, but must sow and plant into their lives. Older women are to teach the younger, and older men to teach the younger. Titus chapter 2. Amen? And I want to say with this, thank you for your patience with me today. I don't often go longer than my self-imposed time. But I want to say this. These people are going to need to be discipled. Amen? And some of you are new believers yourself, and you probably, you're being discipled yourself. But some of you guys who have been in this for a long time, you need to think and pray earnestly and say, you know what? You can go to Toby or come to Pastor, come to me and say, you know, I'm interested in discipling one person. And I want the Lord to help show me who that is. We had Lisa and Jessica and MJ last night go through a little discipleship thing. They're going to be taking these people who got saved along with other churches doing the same thing and following up on them, having coffee with them, praying with them. We've got Bible Bible study books for them to, to encourage them. And we're going to not just win them to the Lord and let them die. You've got to take care of people. Amen? God didn't call us just to win souls. He called us to make disciples. And making disciples is messy business. It takes time. I don't have time, Pastor. Who does have time? I never. Even people that have time don't have time. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> it cracks me up. It's like, well, I guess nobody has time. Listen, you have to make time. It has to become a priority in your life. I can't make it become a priority. I'm not going to beg and plead with, it, with you for it to be a priority. You've got to grow to that place in Jesus, in your relationship with Him, where His stuff is priority stuff in our life. Amen? I realize we're not all there, but He wants us to all get there. Amen?